Hey guys, I'm Matt. I've been living in China on and off for the last 10 years, probably mostly on. Those of you that know me know that I am a consummate optimist, but today's video is going to be a bit different. Today I'm going to target the uh, downsides, the things I've had to deal with that haven't been so positive over the course of the time that I've lived here. I think it's valuable to look at the negatives from time to time, and also I can tell you about how I overcame some of them and dealt with some of them along the way. Number one, communication is cut down. Uh, when you enter an environment that speaks uh, another language and you might not have the skills to communicate back, it can be difficult. When I came to China 10 years ago to live uh, beyond my little business trips, uh, I didn't speak uh, barely any Chinese. And even if I had a fairly good grasp of Chinese, when you immerse yourself in an environment that speaks such a strange language as Chinese, strange being in such a different language from, you know, the English language I speak back home, it's difficult. I found that the first month that I lived here, I had headaches because I was constantly trying to engage with people around me. I was listening too much and my ears were open too much and I was trying to absorb what other people were saying and I just couldn't and it was really, really frustrating. And it, it, it was so frustrating in fact that it, it affected me physically. Um, the solution to that was kind of uh, being able to appreciate being in my own world and being able to appreciate the fact that I can't communicate as well with languages, but maybe I can communicate with other things like physical gestures and uh, a body language. And so being in China immersed in a place where I couldn't communicate as fluidly as I could in the States, I ended up finding alternative ways to communicate and it forced me to try to learn Chinese a little bit more. Number two, no matter how much Chinese you know, no matter how fluent you are, you're still going to have complex communication issues. I guess until you are 100% fluent, like you can grasp language perfectly, but even in China there's so many dialects that locals speak that you can't understand that you end up kind of getting a little depressed. I found it very depressing. As a matter of fact, right now it's it's Chinese New Year holiday and I'm hanging out with my, my wife and child. Uh, yesterday we had a big family meal. Everybody's all around. Everybody's having substantive conversations with their relatives and their friends, deep-rooted conversations about whatever, it might be politics, it might be uh, uh, just life in general. I just can't have those conversations. And that is one of the biggest things about living in China that I have trouble with. I like to talk. When I go home to Detroit, I sit down with my brother-in-law and I hash things out. I end up having really deep conversations that when I walk away from those conversations, I feel like, oh, I just had a load off. I just really worked some things through in my head. And the conversations that you have in China with your Chinese friends, even if they have pretty good English, even if you have pretty good Chinese, it's really tough to have really meaty, substantive conversations. And I found that that has been something that I have really, really missed. That's not to say that I haven't had good conversations, and that's not to say that I haven't been able to communicate with people. I'm just talking about those really deep, one-to-one -one or one-to-group conversations that you can have with people without worry about, I wonder if that word is right, I wonder if I put together that sentence correctly, I wonder if they understand 100% what I'm saying because they, they don't quite, they're looking at me a little weird, or they say something to me that I know that they really want to sink in but I can't quite understand it and I feel bad because I know that it, the, the, the idea they're trying to express was important and uh, I'm not doing justice to what they have to say. For me that was so and is still so, even though my Chinese is okay, it's still a really frustrating thing to not be able to communicate on that level with people uh, in, in a conversational mode. Some of you are coming here for a school program or something. Maybe you have other English teachers who are from your home countries that you can communicate with and that's okay. Uh, this, this point is for people that are trying to integrate and, and maybe don't have those friends. Or like me, I have certain friends that do speak English from, from the West, 
but I don't spend time with them a lot. I end up spending time with my wife's family and, and, and locals. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I am saying that it can get frustrating not being able to express yourself the way that you want to express yourself because of that language barrier. Number three, loneliness. Anybody that's lived in Asia for a little while, I think, uh, that has come from the West has dealt with loneliness. When you're in a place that, again, doesn't speak your language, it can be a time where you have trouble dealing with the fact that you are sort of a character that is alone in the traits that you have. You're from the West, you're a foreigner, you're, you're living in this place where, where you are a small percentage of the population. When I first came here, I didn't speak much Chinese. I came to a place that was uh, majority, I mean, I didn't see the first foreigners uh, for the first three weeks I lived in China. I remember there was a couple of blondes, blonde ladies, and they were riding bicycles and they rode past my building. And I ran out to them and I screamed, American! Because <laughs> I just wanted to work. And they turned around and they screamed back, South African! And, uh, <laughs> and then they rode away. I didn't see him again. I think it was, it was like six months later that I ended up seeing him again. But I had moments in my uh, apartment where I was uh, really alone and I was feeling it. I was doubting myself I was, and I didn't know how I was going to get through it. What I ended up doing is forcing myself to integrate. I was pushing myself to get out there, to go to meetings, to go to social places, and force myself to make friends. But oftentimes it can be difficult. Number four, uh, that loneliness that you might feel can lead you into some bad habits. You are pushing yourself out there to go to, say, clubs or bars and uh, kind of meet people. And if you meet the wrong people or you meet the club crowd, you might find yourself over drinking and, and smoking. Um, smoking in Asia is on the decline, but it's still a lot more than it is in the West. And uh, when, when the kids here or the adults here take you out and they want to go drinking, they drink a lot. And you find that you're going to be putting them down. And um, it's, it's hard to control because uh, the peer pressure here is insane. And they're going to press on you that you have to drink. And then they're going to throw cigarettes at you like, like, like throwing a playing card at you. Boom, boom. And they're tossing. As soon as you finish, you're going to toss another smoke. As soon as you finish, you're going to toss another smoke. But when I first came here, uh, I smoked a lot. And I was smoking because I felt like I had to, because people were um, around me that were like, that's just what we do. We hang out and we smoke and we drink. And like in the States, I like to drink. I'll pound a beer down, for example, and I'll rest with that beer for a while. But in China, the moment that beer is finished, they put another one in your hand and another one in your hand and another one in your hand. And they're kind of encouraging you to drink and, and you're a foreigner, so they're gonna encourage you even more because you're the, you're the odd man out and they're gonna be like, hey, I wanna drink with the foreigner. I wanna smoke with the foreigner. So when I came here, I found that uh, I, I smoked and I drank a lot. I've been able to get the drinking under uh, control. I never got to the point where I was a drunk, but there were a lot of nights I'd come home uh, and, and have a pretty nasty hangover the next day. Cigarette smoking, I've been able to cut out just about completely, and that took a, that took a while as well. But uh, yeah, you're gonna have to be careful and you're gonna have to be confident in the fact that you can say no if somebody passes you something. Honestly, to some people it might be thought of as rude, but you have to do it for yourself. I've met many Chinese guys and a few foreigners that don't drink alcohol at all and they don't smoke at all and they're able to get by too. So don't feel like you have to. You can be the guy that doesn't drink and doesn't smoke, so uh, don't worry about that. Number five, um, the foods here in China are amazing. You can get uh, all sorts of variety of sweets and savories and salties and uh, fish and meats and, and everything, but you're always gonna miss something from back home. I eat almost everything, so I don't really have a problem with not wanting to consume anything, but there are some foods, like I'm from America, so a, a big juicy steak maybe, or a robust salad. I remember searching for uh, a really, really good salad for a long time. What you end up doing is you end up going to the supermarket here and you end up milling around and, and collecting some things together that you can kind of concoct your own Western meals uh, in the privacy of your own place. Number six, missing friends and family back home. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one. 
Uh, I've spent the better part of 10 years here in China and I've always been somewhat of a, uh, a guy that can live uh, away from home. I moved away from Detroit and bounced around to Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Las Vegas. I hadn't been home for a long time, but even if you're bouncing around the States, home is not that far away. When you're living in China, home is a lot farther away and uh, I miss conversations and sitting down and having a coffee with my sister. I miss, you know, giving my mom a hug and just doing those things that were so easy to do when you live down the street from family and friends. I think that's a character building exercise. Uh, a lot of people lean on their family a lot. They feel like, you know, well, my family's close, so maybe I don't have to risk this, or maybe I don't have to go out and make new friends because I've got, you know, all of my siblings around me. And making new friends is one of the most important things about growing as an individual. And uh, living abroad helps you to make new friends, substantial friendships. All right, seven. Um, this is an important one. When you're in China and you're a foreigner uh, and you look different and you're like a, a small percentage of the population, people will use you. They'll use you to make money. They'll use you for leverage. They'll use you you know, to help their business. Schools will hire foreigners at, at bottom rates, promising them all these kind of things and then screw them and kick them to the curb. You'll find that uh, people will be, you know, encouraging you to do gigs or, or even encouraging you to hang out with them. And you know that it's not because they care about you, it's because they want to hang out with a foreigner or they want to be, you know, kind of hip or cool. All, all sorts of different reasons people are going to try to use you because of who you are and the way that you look. In many cases, you can use that to your advantage. You can actually leverage that and get opportunities that you might not have been able to get in the States. I. Uh, was able to produce a TV show here in China. I never produced a show or did any video work ever and I produced a network television show that ended up pushing me onto my YouTube channel and traveling around the world. In a lot of ways I was able to torque opportunities that were given to me because I was unique into uh, opportunities that ended up helping me uh, in life. But I've heard a lot of horror stories, uh, teachers in particular, that get picked and pulled into a school and they uh, are abused, they're, they're worked to the bone, uh, they are held on contract because of their passport or their visa uh, process and they're manipulated. And you have to be careful that you're not manipulated. Uh, keep your eyes open. If something is too good to be true, sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't, but you need to be really open and you also need to understand and, and you need to have your senses all open so that you don't get trapped into a in, uh, situation that you're not prepared for. Oftentimes, if somebody wants to take my passport for something, I'm not too keen on that as opposed to maybe being manipulated into something that you can back away from. If you can back away from it without too much problem, then I say go for it and ride the wave. And if the wave ends up breaking up on you, then you can back away. But you gotta worry about how deep you get your, your foot in the door so that you don't get your, the door closed on you and you end up getting trapped. So keep your eyes open, keep your senses aware and watch out because there can be opportunities that might come to you that are coming to you for nefarious reasons and that will end up uh, doing you harm in the end. Number eight, feeling trapped. There have been many times, and I don't talk about them a lot because I'm a pretty positive guy and I try to keep things pretty uh, uh, happy-go-lucky. But there are a lot of times where I find myself trapped. I'm in a place that is uh, so far away from home. It's not, it's, it's like we're talking almost a thousand dollars just to get home. And you find that a lot of the friends that you might have are, are, have gone home. They're not here. And when your friends aren't here, you are alone. Let's just take Chinese New Year, for example. I have family. I have a daughter and a wife, but there was a long time I didn't and uh, this place would pretty much shut down. So you're in a place that doesn't speak your language. You don't really have the ease of getting around as you would living back home and you can feel trapped. It's a real physical emotion. You feel stress and anxiety and you think, what am I going to do? What am I doing here? I don't have anywhere I can go. There's nowhere I feel comfortable. Uh, especially in the first year or so that you live outside in Asia, you can feel like nothing feels comfortable. 
and when there's nobody around that you can kind of latch on to, like say, you know, when you're home, you can always latch on to people from home, you know what I mean? They're always with you, but uh, when they're not, you can feel trap. Oftentimes, these sorts of uh, emotions that I have, these negative emotions, they come and they, they build up and then they go away. It's like a wave. And you know, it might happen once or twice a year. Some people it might happen more. But sometimes I just allow it to come, reside, and then go. Just understanding in my mind that it's an emotion, it's something I'm feeling, and it's gonna go, say, after Chinese New Year, or it's gonna go over time. You let these things fester. Sometimes uh, other people might say, you need to fight it all the time. But oftentimes, fighting it can be futile, especially if you think you're, tr you're feeling trapped. That's like a, a, a visceral emotion. And you try to go outside and you might feel trapped even more. You, want, you, know, you try and put yourself out there and like counteract it, uh, and, and you, you end up finding that it, it's counterproductive. Sometimes, if I'm depressed, if I'm sad, I say, I'm only gonna let this uh, affect me for you know, a week at most, or a few days at most, and then I'm gonna get through it and you kind of just ride the wave out. I found that that's like the best way to deal with feeling trapped. Number nine, simple problems aren't easily solved. <laughs> you know, sometimes things like getting your phone uh, hooked up or getting a, a correct phone plan or, you know, I remember taking my first taxi, taking the subway, uh, going shopping for the first time. Almost everything, especially in the beginning phase that you think is easy, simple, becomes like some of the most difficult things ever and that can be just a confidence killer because I'm a pretty independent guy but there's some things that I just cannot do. In my business I, I owned an import export company and I'd be damned if I knew how to process the the actual import and export of goods. You need somebody with you that speaks the language and can understand the process and it can help you through it. So it can become very difficult to do things that you ordinarily could do on your own. And it's kind of like a, like I said, it's like a confidence bust because you feel like, am I weak? Am I, uh, am I not a strong person because I can't do these simple things? What you have to realize is that you are a strong person. You've moved to China. You're taking that leap. And everybody has had these difficulties and everybody is having these difficulties even as you're having these difficulties. And you just gotta, gotta get through it and find people that can help you and understand that asking for help is not a negative. It's not like thinking that you're weak. It's just, it's actually a strength. If you can rely on somebody to help you with something that you might not be able to do, but you might have been able to do it easy in the States, well, it just is the way it is because you're living in China and some things aren't that easy. So it's, it, it, for me, it was, it was really difficult because I, I found I, I wanted to do everything myself. I, I like to do things myself. I, I know a little bit about a lot of things and I know that because I like to do a lot of jobs. I, I find it very difficult to have employees because I'm always like, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. But in China, you have to let go of some of those simple things and let other people do those things for you because you literally cannot do those things until, say, your language skill grows or your, um, you're comfortable in this environment to do it yourself. Uh, number 10 is a big one, finding true friends. Um, I have made a lot of friends in China. A lot of people that I've met here, I've formed big relationships with. They're uh, uh, great people. People that, that are on my top five list of friends in, in my entire life. The frustrating thing is they all leave. Uh, there was a Turkish guy, Ibrahim. I love this guy. We would go to the clubs and we would talk about his religion and my religion. We'd have coffees and talk about politics and we would come together every weekend and we would spend time together. He was one of my best friends. But his contract ended and he left China. People that come to China that might be foreigners that you try to found friendships with, they, they are here often on a clock. Uh, I've been here the longest out of most of the people I know. There's a few guys here that have been here longer, but for the most part, I've been here longer than, than anybody. It can be lonely. It pulls into that lonely aspect because you cannot find substantial, substantial friendships take a little while to found. Uh, my, one of my best friends, Ryan, a uh, teacher, came here. I met him in Ningbo. Uh, Ningbo, China is where I live, and we ended up becoming fast friends, and, and we traveled together. He's one of the reasons that I do this YouTube thing, that one of the reasons I'm traveling around the world on a trike. Do you guys know that? I'm cycling around the world on a trike. <laughs> it was very difficult to, f 
to, to, to let him go. He ended up having to leave because he was finishing his contract with teaching. And we still maintain contact, but oftentimes when you live in the West, uh, near, your, near your home, your friends don't necessarily leave all the time. You know, or if they leave, they're one state away. Ryan is on the other side of the world. My friend Ibrahim's in Turkey. And um, I, I, I'm going to see them eventually, but you have to kind of uh, understand that a lot of your friends, uh, the really, really good ones, they're not going to be here that long. Sometimes you can find friends that are live here in China, for sure, for sure, I'm not discounting that. But a lot of times us expats, we find uh, expatriate friendships, the ones that are very substantial and a lot of those people end up leaving and that can be a very difficult thing to deal with. Uh, a lot of people have friendships that last entire lifetimes and their friends stay with them, especially if I still lived in the States, the friends that I used to hang out with every day would still be the friends I hang out with every day. They wouldn't be going anywhere. But in China, everybody's coming or going and uh, that's something that, that I've had uh, a difficulty dealing with and I've had to let go of some really great friends and uh, it's been sad. Number 11. Certain personalities in China can become very jaded. Uh, you end up becoming one of those sort of China haters, you know. Ah, this place is shit, everything's dirty, people are not nice, blah blah blah. This, you, th you end up looking at people talking in Chinese and you think they're always talking about you. There's a bunch of people who feel like that. There's a bunch of people who, who they only live in these little pocketed foreigner hangouts. And so they, they kind of get this other world view of the country that they're living in. They're living in China. There's no time for being anti-Chinese if you're living in China in a lot of cases. And some of these people do become jaded and they feel like the rest of the world is out to get them. And uh, I, I meet a lot of these people at the bars and they'll be like, I hate this country. Uh, China sucks. How long you been here? Uh, seven years or something, you know. What are you doing here? You have a choice to be wherever you want to be. If you don't want to be in China or you hate it. People ask me, uh, how long you've lived in China? I said 10 years. Do you like it? And my answer is always the same. I've lived here 10 years. I would never live 10 years in a place that I didn't enjoy living in. Uh, there are definitely some things, like for example in this video, that I have problems with. But none of them are to the extent to where I'm feeling like uh, I hate this place. You could see my videos and see that I enjoy China very much. But there's a lot of people that become jaded. Oftentimes I'll feel like people are, you know, might be talking behind my back. And you know what I do? I don't care. You know, living in China has given me the opportunity to build a really thick skin. Doing this YouTube channel as well, dealing with comments in the comment section. I know you guys are, some of you are going to pick me apart for something I said here. I don't even know yet. Um, but living in China uh, and not really understanding everything, it kind of gives you the opportunity to kind of say, well, you know what? I don't know what they're saying about me. It could be bad. It could be good. But uh, it is what it is. And they're not in my life. They're walking past me. They're looking at me in the back of my video. They might be, you know, sitting down, staring at me for some weird reason. And does it, does it affect me? I think that's what you got to do. Does it affect you? And, and if you're living in Asia, you got to look around, look at the smiles, absorb the smiles, and, and it just slough off the smirks. Because oftentimes, it's their problem. Some people, I, I had one guy that wanted to fight me because I was a foreigner in a bar. He had ended up kicked down a door at the bar I was, I was at. And I came up to him, I said, why you kick that door? This is my, it was my friend's bar. He's like, you're gonna break that door. Fuck you, foreigner. He said, I, I, I hate you. you. You shouldn't be in our country. And it made me angry. But then I started thinking about him. He must live a hate-filled life. And I ended up feeling sorry for him more than I felt troubled myself. I think that's kind of how you gotta look at it. 12. Feeling obligated or pressured. Sometimes you have situations, especially because you're here and oftentimes you feel alone, that um, if somebody does come to you and say you need to be part of my thing, whether it's a, you need to come to my party or you need to come and help me work in my office or you need to, you know, you, oftentimes I have felt very pressured and obligated to do things that I might ne not necessarily have wanted to do. And it's difficult sometimes to say no. For example, in the States, um, I am a little bit more planted solidly in uh, my hometown. Somebody comes up and says, I want you to help me with this X, Y, or Z. I can say, no, I have a bunch of other things going on. I am rooted in my environment and I can, I can choose to do almost anything that I want. Whereas in China, you're sort of floating. 
especially in the first uh, months or even years that you live here, you can feel like you, you aren't quite rooted in your place. So if somebody comes and says, I want you to do something, and you might not be confident enough to say, I, I, I don't want to do that, I've got other things, I've got this and this and this that I'm doing. You can't really come up with this, this and this because you're always floating around. You're like, well, okay. And then you end up doing something and you don't like it and it ends up uh, perverting your worldview. You become one of those jaded people and you say, everybody's kind of manipulating me and it can, it can create a vicious circle. I think it's very important as a, a foreigner living in China that you uh, assert yourself. If you want to do something, you do it. You you don't do it if you don't want to do it. And you stick to that. Because uh, the, the second you start breaking yourself down and becoming a little bit more fluid and liquid uh, with, with opportunities that you might not be open to or wanting to do, uh, you can become depressed and frustrated with your situation. Uh, the alternative to that is being able to say, you know what, I'm going to do that thing and I'm going to make something positive out of it. And oftentimes I've done that too, where, where I might get involved in something I'm not really excited about doing, but it, I twist it into a positive and I end up coming out of it with some new knowledge, some new skills, an opportunity with somebody I met at that event or, or, or thing, and, and I end up twisting a negative into a positive. Number 13, living with pollution. Uh, now, all of China is not polluted. You can go inland, Lijiang, beautiful blue skies. China is a huge country, but a lot of the foreigners and the expats live uh, near the coast, and uh, there's a lot of pollution to deal with. It's something that I never had to deal with in the States. In the States, uh, my hometown, even in Detroit, which is an industrial city, we never had the amount of pollution that we have here, you know? Um, so. Uh, it's something that you have to get around, the idea that uh, I might not be able to go outside and, and do my, my run today because uh, there's just too much pollution to deal with. The reason that China is, is such an amazing place is the fact that it's growing. And you have old here next to new over here. <laughs> and a lot of times if you want the new, you gotta build it. And you gotta build it quick, and China's building quick. And so one of the things I love about China is the fact that it's expanding and growing all the time. And one of the things I have to deal with with a country that's expanding and growing so much is the fact that it, it can get a little dusty and polluted. And it, it, you know, it's just something you have to deal with that most people outside of China don't have to deal with. Uh, and it, I'm, I say China, but I say Asia as well. I'm cycling through uh, Vietnam. It's, it's quite polluted there as well. There's pollution uh, quite a bit in Asia, but it, like I said, it is growing, but it is something I've had to deal with and something I haven't been really <laughs> happy with having to deal with. Number 14, uh, the restriction to information. In China, I, I cannot access uh, YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any of the things that you pretty much have probably found me on without the use of a secondary uh, uh, um, proxy server called a VPN. Very frustrating. Oftentimes they can turn it off on you. You can have access to information one day and not the next. Sometimes I upload one of these videos, it takes me four hours. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work on my phone and uh, I have to find a laptop and I can't do things mobily. Oftentimes in, in, in China maps, Google Maps is off by uh, often like two or three hundred meters. Like the point that you want to go to and the point that's plotted on your map is off. There's all sorts of crazy things that you have to deal with that uh, you don't have to deal with at all if you're, if you're in the States or in, you're in Europe or you're outside of China. Being restricted on information is something that uh, most people in the West take for granted. They, they have full access and uh, it's really wonderful to be able to access all the things you want to access and, and not have to use a VPN or be throttled down or worry about somebody peeking over your shoulder. And I, I pretty much have reserved myself to the idea that the Chinese government is looking at everything that I uh, look at or post or, or go through, whether I have a VPN on or not. I, I'm under the assumption that they're watching everything. Um, I don't do anything too nefarious. My videos are pretty benign, so I'm not really worried about it. But I sure wish that they'd speed it up. I don't mind them looking, just speed it up. I mean, I know I'm in China. There's certain things that I reserve the right to understand that uh, it's just the way it works here. 
but yeah, the, the, the lack of access or easy access to information or having to go through hurdles in order to access that information is a downside. And that's about it. I, I, I just wanted to go through this because I think it's important that before you take a plunge to say move to, to Asia, that you understand some of the things that might be looking at you. You can, you can preempt them with, with uh, different thoughts that you can train yourself to think or different ideas that you can train yourself about. I'll tell you what. You can evolve too. When I came here, communication was so hard. I had, I had no real friends that I could communicate like really well with. I like communication. So you know what I did? I ended up making this channel. And I'm communicating now with you guys through this vehicle here. So in a lot of ways, I, I, I evolved to create this channel because I had a lack of, of the real substantive conversation and uh, communications that I really wanted to have. So I created uh, this YouTube channel as an opportunity for me to share my life. Oftentimes when you watch my videos, I'm communicating to you guys like I am communicating to my friends because I am communicating to my friends. You are all my friends. And uh, so that's how I, I protected myself or I fought those uh, downsides. And you can do it too in, in whatever way that you find works for you. I love to make videos, I love to travel. I've created a travel uh, vlog and travel video series and I communicate with the world through that series and that communication uh, helps me feel comfortable living in Asia. I think without the vlog, I might fall into some uh, feelings of isolation. But being able to pull the camera out and communicate with all you guys, I, thousands of you are gonna, uh, are hopefully gonna watch this and find something important out of it. And it's almost like I've had a, uh, a nice conversation with thousands of people just now outside of Dongqian Lake here uh, in Ningbo. Uh, so uh, let me end that with uh, an, uh, an open opportunity for you to communicate with me. Tell me anything that I've missed. Some downsides of living in Asia, some stuff that you might have dealt with that, uh, and also include some things that might have helped you get over those downsides. Let's not just talk about the negatives, let's talk about what we do uh, about those things in order to become better and more comfortable in the place that we are living. I will say that if you are thinking about moving to Asia, that you should do it. It's very important, it's opened my eyes to the world and perspectives, and dealing with the downsides is part of life. I've become a stronger individual because I've had to deal with certain things and get over them, and uh, like I said earlier, my time here in China has been uh, majority tenfold positive. Share this with your friends that might be interested in understanding some of the downsides of potentially moving to Asia. Join me as I uh, travel around the world. I'll be headed back to Vietnam in a few days. We'll be back on the road cycling around the world and I will be taking you along with me. So Jai Il, add fuel to life in whatever you're doing and I will see you later.